name's Tim Malloy and I'm the President of the uh, Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners and I'd like to welcome you to this session which has been labelled the University Challenge Session which I think is a misnomer because uh, I certainly don't see this as a challenge, I see this as an opportunity. Um, I've been in rural general practice for 30 years and 7 months and I have been waiting 30 years and seven months to be even having this conversation. So I think this is a wonderful outcome that we in the rural sector are talking about trying to produce um, graduates into primary care for rural New Zealand specifically. And I embrace this debate and its potential outcomes for all of us because I think it's a wonderful step forward. All of you know that one of New Zealand's ongoing challenges is attracting and retaining health professionals to rural and provincial centres. Many ideas and initiatives have been developed to help address this challenge, but there's no silver bullet. Solving this problem requires collaboration and ongoing effort from multiple parties like the College, the Ministry of Health, local government and the local communities themselves. Recently, some of our tertiary institutions have turned their attention towards this issue. As a result, we now have two options that are being considered. A new Waikato Medical School, which will deliver graduate entry medical training in the Waikato and at regional clinical education sites throughout the central North Island. A new National School of Rural Health proposed by the University of Otago and the University of Auckland which would see up to 20 interprofessional rural sites established to train health professionals. To understand the key differences to these two proposals, we've invited Professor Neil Quigley, Vice-Chancellor from the Waikato University, and Professor Peter Crampton, Pro-Vice-Chancellor of Health Sciences and Dean of the Otago Medical School at the University of Otago, to talk to us. We will give them the floor for 15 minutes each, after which I will take questions from the audience. First up, I believe, is Peter. Uh, is that correct, Peter? And then uh, he'll be followed by Neil. Thanks very much. Over to you, Peter. I will just briefly introduce myself again, and Tim has introduced me, but just there may be some people here who were not at the, uh, the session earlier this morning when I spoke. So my institutional roles for the University of Otago are Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences, being in charge of the health sciences part of the university nine health professional programs and, and a very dispersed geography um, with three main campuses in Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin, but many, many outposts up and down the country as well. Our northernmost staff member is in Rawani in the Hokianga and our southernmost uh, staff member is in uh, Invercargill. And we have students placed all over, including in Pacific nations and East Coast Australia. So that's my role. And the purpose of this presentation is to communicate to you about the proposed National School of Rural Health. And Tim, please, can you give me uh, five minutes warning or three minutes warning with the time because I, I need to stay on a message here. So um, this is what I propose to talk about. <clears throat> the problem, we're very focused on a particular problem and I'm going to talk about that problem. And the proposed solution to that problem, which is the proposed National School of Rural Health. I'll talk through that with a number of slides talking about the, the key components of the proposal. And then give a, a high level overview of the, the categories of costs which are involved with that. A summary of the benefits and then it's an indication of where we're going, what the next steps are. So I started taking an interest in this personally in my role. Uh, in, uh, towards the latter part of 2012 when I uh, initiated the process of a, uh, a rural health strategy for the Division of Health Sciences, which I had. And uh, I asked Gary Nixon, who I think is here. Hi, Gary, if you're here. Hi. <clears throat> to lead that process. Gary is a rural hospital medicine specialist uh, who is based at Dunstan Hospital in central Otago is employed by the University of uh, Otago. So Gary has led that process. And that came on the back of a review we'd had of the Rural Medical Immersion Program, which is actually 10 years old this year. And um, <clears throat> right from the start, Gary was saying to me, 
the embedded in, in, the, in the strategic process we were going through was the idea of a national, uh, sorry, of a rural school, a rural clinical school was the language used at the time. And Gary said, there has to be a national joined up solution to this. We have to do this nationally in a coordinated way. And so we talked around that and that's the direction that the discussion took. And in 2015, about halfway through 2015, discussions with the University of Auckland opened up to, 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 uh, to um, discuss a, a, a coordinated national approach. The problem, I'm gonna talk about the problem. The problem that we're seeking to address with our proposal are an essential component of the fabric of New Zealand society. And there is inherent value in maintaining a diverse health workforce in rural communities. In addition to that, there is the economic contribution of rural communities to New Zealand as a whole. Uh, we're thinking about primary production, agriculture, fisheries, and uh, tourism. So it's absolutely essential that we as a national community sustain essential infrastructure in rural communities to sustain those communities. So that is the issue. One can translate that into jargon and say that there is a maldistribution of the healthcare workforce with an insufficient uh, healthcare workforce in many, many rural communities. We're also interested in equity and health outcomes for rural communities. And our proposal is very much focused on addressing those issues. So our solution. Our solution is a national solution. It's aimed at the entire country. It's a collaborative solution. So at the moment, the formal members of the collaboration are the University of Auckland, University of Otago, uh, the New Zealand Rural GPs Network, the Royal New Zealand College of GPs, and AUT. And there are many other organizations that we're having conversations with. And when I come to next steps, I'll talk about the, the relationships that we'll need to form and, and the other organizations that we'll need to consult with as we go through the process. So it's a national solution, it's collaborative, and, it's, and it builds, very much builds on the existing network of regional and rural uh, infrastructure solutions and services which are out there. I might say, uh, by way of a very, very small digression, and following up on comments I made this morning in the keynote address, <clears throat> that also embedded in this proposal is the notion of investment in communities for health professional education. Now, I know we're focused on rural communities today, but it's very much an application of the principle that I referred to this morning of New Zealand society investing in the infrastructure for health workforce development and training and academic activity within communities, in this case, rural communities. So um, <clears throat> we're talking about setting up 10 hubs in rural communities in partnership with rural communities, 10 hubs. We're aiming for 20 plus in the future, but the proposal is to commence on 10 hubs based in rural communities in partnership. Each hub will be based around a rural hospital. Now, this is not new in and of itself, and I'm just gonna show you a slide which reflects the comment I made before about the distribution of um, students, health professional students for the University of Otago alone. Now, they are out there uh, in communities already. And so the 10 hub or the 20 hub proposal ultimately builds on what's there and the investment and in infrastructure that has occurred over the years including the 200 general practices that we have relationships with already. And another graphic which can, um, has on it some of the rural hospital hubs, potential locations for the um, proposed National School of Rural Health. The actual process of selecting hub sites has not occurred yet. Uh, just about every rural community would put its hand up for 
uh, hub, and we need to go through a structured, fair, open, transparent process about where those investments should occur. We will adopt a hub and spoke model where the hub is in the, uh, based around the rural hospital and the spokes will consist of healthcare providers, pharmacies, physiotherapists, dentists if they're there, uh, general practices, etc. They will be the spokes and students from different disciplines will come in to the hub and learn together in a structured way um, with the, uh, based on the educational principles of interprofessional education. Now, we're starting off, as I said, with a, uh, a proposal for funding for 10 hubs. Ultimately, this is very, very scalable. And we could scale up to 20. Tim's view is that should be at least 20 hubs. We're starting with 10. And it could go well beyond 20. So all our calculations around costings and so on have been around the scalability of it and the potential for future investment in, in more hubs as we move forward. And as I said, the principle of interprofessional education is uh, the key educational principle, which will underpin the interaction of students and their experience within the hubs. This is about students learning together in a structured way, in an interprofessional way, where the learning outcomes include the appreciation of and the experience of and the ability to work with other colleagues, health professional colleagues. And in order for that to be effective, students need to witness their mentors and teachers behaving in a functional interprofessional way. And rural communities are the ideal uh, location for that to occur because generally interprofessional behaviour is well modelled and it is not always well modelled in the New Zealand health system. So uh, initially we're talking about five disciplines, nursing, midwifery, pharmacy, physiotherapy and medicine. But of course the scope for many other disciplines as well. But that's, that's our starting point here. Rurally based academic and teaching roles is another feature of this model. So the academics who teach, who run it, who do the research will be based in rural communities. So we're building an academic workforce based in rural communities. That is really, really important. So people will lead their academic lives embedded in their rural community. There we are. Um, and of course, it's all based around generalist practice. The definition of rural for the purposes of this proposal, and there are many definitions of rural, uh, is focused on generalism. Communities which rely on generalists, be they generalist physiotherapists, generalist uh, medical practitioners, or generalist um, anything. It's about generalism. OK, uh, moving on to the I'll show you the slide here. Three minutes, thank you. Okay, I'll flick over that one and just move on to the um, costs. Uh, this gives you an impression of the categories of costs. As I said this morning, uh, shifting resources into community settings, be they rural or urban, makes costs visible. And that poses challenges so that we simply have to work our way through. Uh, society has, over many, many generations, invested its teaching, training, uh, and workforce development infrastructure and expenditure around institutions. And now we're in the process of shifting those resources into community settings. It makes the cost visible. We need to make the investment in communities so that health workforce development and training can occur within communities. Uh, Teacher-student ratios tend to be higher in these sorts of settings. And for, for example, with the Rural Medicine Immersion Program that we run and have run now for 10 years, uh, often the teacher-student ratio is one to one. So it is absolutely guilt-edged education. But of course, that has costs associated with it because we lose the economies of scale that might occur with groups of students learning together in uh, other institutional settings. Right, just to finish, Tim, uh, the benefits. <clears throat> 
This is a step change, it's a game changer. This is about us requesting government to explicitly acknowledge the value of community-based education. Now, again, I said it this morning, we're on this journey anyway. This is um, not conceptually new, but it is a step change. This is about very deliberate, very focused social investment and a solution to a problem. Um, I'll let you read those points. I won't go through them, otherwise Tim's going to get stressed. Um, but I would like to emphasize also that we're talking about locating academic careers in rural communities. That's really, really important to us. Next steps, there's a lot of work to do. Um, currently, the proposal is being scrutinized by uh, colleagues, policy colleagues in Treasury, in the Ministry of Health, and in the Tertiary Education Commission. And uh, they're coming back with questions, and we're going through an iterative process for them, and they will uh, ultimately offer advice up to their ministers, principally the Minister of Health and the Ministry, Minister of Tertiary Education. There's a great deal more consultation for us to conduct. Um, we work to the mantra of nothing about us without us in terms of rural communities. So we haven't named any rural communities where there will be a rural hub yet because we think it would be unethical to raise expectations until we have some certainty about the future. So look, um, that's a high level overview, I'm aware. Um, the costings are still under discussion, so we're, we haven't put those out there yet in, in a detailed form. I, I'd love to get questions after Neil has spoken. Um, I may not be able to answer them all, but I'll do my best. And I would just like to acknowledge um, the many leaders and colleagues from rural communities and, and from our own organisations who participated in that, uh, in the proposal. And Gary's here and, and Phil is here too. They put huge amounts of work into this over the years, uh, over the last, um, well, for, in Gary's case, five years, and Tim's case over the last year or so. So thank you very much, and thank you to the uh, rural health professionals who supported this. Namihi mahana kia koto, kia rangamariye, kia tato katoa. Thank you. So thanks, Peter, uh, and uh, also Tim for your introduction. Uh, and uh, because Peter's covered uh, some of the territory, that hopefully will save me a minute or two as I go through mine. Uh, I will um, perhaps start a couple of steps back uh, from where uh, Peter started. Uh, first, perhaps, uh, with uh, the question, uh, why am I here, which I think is probably a reasonable question. Many of you will know uh, that uh, I uh, am not uh, a doctor of medicine. Uh, I'm an economist. Uh, and uh, that uh, is uh, obviously a reason um, uh, not to be here, uh, but unfortunately uh, I don't yet have a Dean of Medicine, uh, so uh, it's just me uh, that you get. Uh, the second thing about uh, being an economist, though, and thinking about these issues is that uh, I had to read the literature uh, and talk to people to find out what the issues seemed to be. Uh, and when I say read the literature, I don't mean read the New Zealand literature. I mean read the medical education literature internationally. And it's really uh, very illuminating. And of course, the first thing that it's, uh, that it's illuminating for is the expression of the huge diversity of approaches to medical education that work in different places and different countries and that address different health workforce needs. Uh, so for me, uh, that's been an important starting point. Uh, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, those who've been part of our advisory group uh, and uh, engaged in the discussions, uh, some at different points. Uh, Joe Scott Jones, who I see is here, hi. Uh, but also uh, Ross Lawrenson, Judy McKim, Roger Strasser, Lance O'Sullivan, Ian Town, and Reese Tapsell. Uh, Peter's probably thinking a more disreputable and dangerous bunch has never been assembled, but uh, there we go. Uh, so um, it's also a proposal that's been developed uh, with the Waikato DHB, uh, not because it was ever intended to be exclusive uh, with the Waikato DHB, but really because uh, we had to start somewhere. 
And we started there uh, with a chief executive and a board of the DHB who were really very interested uh, in these issues uh, with a tertiary hospital uh, whose staff are greatly underutilised for medical education and training, uh, and also in the Waikato with um, a DHB who have really significant health workforce challenges that they're trying to work through. And uh, the discussion uh, with the University of Waikato was in significant part based just around uh, that question of um, uh, how the Waikato DHB was going to deal uh, with the workforce challenges uh, that uh, it has had. So uh, for uh, that conversation uh, to emerge as a contribution to a national discussion uh, certainly pleases me. Uh, I, whatever the outcome of the government's deliberations, I'm certainly uh, pleased for the little that we have done uh, to promote this discussion uh, and uh, to uh, bring to an end uh, Tim's 37 years of uh, waiting for the, uh, for the debate uh, to get onto a firm footing. A second uh, step back uh, as the starting point uh, is also uh, on uh, the fact that in developing our proposal, we thought both about uh, the absolute number of doctors uh, that this country needs, as well as what Peter referred to as the distributional issues. So you do hear people in New Zealand say, we are currently training enough doctors for New Zealand's needs. But actually what that means is, as long as we assume that we're going to go on importing as many international medical graduates as we do now, uh, and we'll do that for the foreseeable future, then we are training enough doctors for our needs. Uh, but at the moment, uh, as many of you will know, something like 43% of the medical workforce in New Zealand are uh, international medical graduates who've come to New Zealand uh, following their training overseas. Uh, and uh, there is, at least according to Health Workforce New Zealand, uh, no indication that that requirement uh, for international medical graduates uh, to fill uh, up to 30% uh, of our workforce slots is going to be reduced in the foreseeable future. We have some critical uh, workforce shortages, uh, as you all know uh, better than I do, uh, in uh, general practice, uh, particularly outside the main centres, uh, but in a wide variety of other specialties where uh, our reliance on international medical graduates goes well beyond 50% of the total workforce. In the Waikato DHB, uh, there are uh, 36 psychiatrists uh, registered with the DHB, of whom only two are New Zealand graduates. So, uh, you know, there are, uh, there's a lot of work uh, to do, uh, I believe, not just on the distributional issues, but on the question of training enough doctors in New Zealand uh, for New Zealand's needs. I think it is a reasonable question to ask from a public policy point of view, you know, why it is that in the medium to long term, New Zealand could not train enough doctors uh, to meet its needs. And particularly from the point of view, uh, as you will understand, since it's a political issue, from the point of view of politicians, to be uh, confronted with families who ask the question, well, someone from our family wanted to be a doctor, but they were told there were not enough places for them to be able to get in to train as a doctor. But at the same time, the country is importing hundreds of foreign trained doctors every year to fill our health workforce needs. So people reasonably ask how that could be. Could it really be that uh, New Zealanders are not overall intelligent enough to produce enough doctors to provide doctors 
uh, in the numbers needed by our society? Uh, or is it that we've constrained the pathways into medicine uh, and the capacity to train medical graduates in a way that uh, reduces uh, our ability to train our own doctors? Of course, at the moment, uh, the number of doctors that we need uh, is increasing because of a variety of factors, uh, some of which, again, you will be better aware of than, than I am. But one that's very interesting at the moment, and I noticed that something uh, that Tim put out recently referred to this, is the impact of immigration. Uh, 72,000 uh, net migrants coming into New Zealand in the last 12 months. Uh, and that has been the case now uh, for a sustained period. Uh, wearing another hat, which is um, my role uh, as the chair of the board of the Reserve Bank, uh, I know that um, we uh, are predicting some softening in those immigration numbers, but uh, we've been predicting that for a while, uh, and the numbers just keep on coming. Uh, and the issue for New Zealand is that our economy is actually doing very well compared to most of the rest of the OECD. Uh, we look like a very attractive place, not just for New Zealanders to come back to, uh, but also for non-New Zealanders to work in. Uh, so that combined with the other obvious factors uh, that we know about uh, is a significant issue uh, for us, uh, including uh, the gradual reduction in the average number of hours worked by each doctor uh, in practice. Uh, we also know uh, that you know, the issue with workforce shortage is greatest outside the main centres, uh, and we understand quite a lot about the implications of those shortages uh, for health outcomes. Uh, and in addition to the impact on health outcomes, <coughs> The way in which uh, people delaying seeing uh, doctors because they cannot get an appointment uh, or uh, having to drive long distances uh, to get uh, medical care uh, increases the overall costs of the health system. The proposal that we've put up uh, suggests that uh, only a third medical school uh, can address these combination of challenges that we have in the health workforce. But it's not just a matter of uh, additional medical uh, education places in the system. If we are to solve the problems that we've got, the combination of geographical and specialty distribution uh, and total numbers, a third medical school in New Zealand is going to have to do things as differently as is possible from the way in which Auckland and Otago do things now. Now that's not to say that what Auckland and Otago do now uh, is bad. My point is there's benefit in diversity uh, because diversity of models of medical education also produces diversity in health workforce outcomes. And that's a key finding of the international literature. And there's been quite a lot of talk uh, in the, uh, shall we say, public part of the debate about the cost of a third medical school. I am, um, of course, uh, in the uh, advantageous situation of having submitted to the government a very detailed business case uh, for the Waikato uh, Medical School proposal. Uh, so it is fully costed and has been for some time. And those, fully, those full costings uh, include all of the costs of the regional uh, community uh, education centres that we are proposing to set up and the postgraduate training uh, that would be associated uh, for the 60 uh, extra, extra places that we have asked for. Uh, and, and of course, the cost of a third medical school is overwhelmingly just the cost of 60 extra places in the system. 
uh, the cost of a third medical school that is unique just to having a third school uh, is relatively limited to the period uh, in which uh, that school would need to have deans and associate deans and some core staff to develop curriculum before there was uh, student income to fund that. But once there are students in the school, uh, the cost of running a third school would be just the same per student as the cost of running the two existing schools, um, uh, we assume. So what we've proposed, uh, as I think you'll all be aware, uh, is a program that follows uh, what uh, many of you will uh, know as uh, the Australian model uh, of graduate entry only, with a four-year intensive uh, program. Uh, that program uh, is uh, intensive uh, over four years, uh, but uh, the outcomes uh, from those graduate programs in Australia have been very positive. And of course, it's now the case that the majority of the uh, medical education programs in Australia are graduate entry only. Um, the other aspect of our proposal uh, that I think is very important because it is an issue that's been raised uh, in the literature is uh, that uh, we uh, would be proactive uh, in developing uh, a uh, a series of uh, clinical placement opportunities for our students uh, and, uh, and also uh, postgraduate training opportunities. The idea with our clinical uh, training centres uh, is that uh, they would be centres in which there were medical students uh, as well as postgraduates. And we think around the country there are a lot of opportunities uh, to develop those. Uh, and, uh, and in that sense, at least, uh, our proposal is very similar to what uh, Peter has uh, described and, and we would certainly agree about the opportunities that exist around the country to do more uh, in that way. Uh, so um, uh, I'll just, uh, in the uh, two and a half minutes that I've got remaining, uh, cover a couple of things. Um, one is uh, our proposal says that we would take students from general undergraduate degrees. Now, it's been suggested by some people in New Zealand that that is a very radical thought. Uh, but again, if you read the international literature, it is not uh, radical at all. Uh, and indeed, what the international literature says is that students who come from generalist undergraduate programs and enter graduate entry medicine programs perform just as well in those programs as students who've done science undergraduate degrees. And secondly, actually, that the students of all sorts benefit from the interaction between students who've done generalist and students who've done science undergraduate degrees as part of their education uh, in medicine. And one of the things that I found in the literature which fascinated me uh, and which I hadn't been aware of until um, uh, late last year when I first came across it, uh, is that at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, they have now for 20 years taken 25 to 30 percent of their students from a humanities undergraduate entry pathway. Uh, and the interesting thing about uh, the students who come through that pathway is, again, they do just as well as the ones from science undergraduate degrees, but they choose primary care specialties uh, with much higher probability uh, than students who've come through the science undergraduate pathway. Uh, and uh, one final point. What the literature says and what um, Interestingly, uh, Des Gorman has just recorded in an editorial in the journal Internal Medicine in an article that's coming out in Medical Education, is that mix and match really doesn't work. So one of the things about the Waikato Medical School is that 100% of every student cohort would be expected to end up in a primary care specialty. 
So this is not just encouraging 10% of our students to think that being a general practitioner would be a good thing. It is about 100% of the students and 100% of the ethos of the school being focused on those outcomes. Now, of course, the students might choose other things, and they will have opportunities to do that. But it's that expectation which is critical for those exemplar programs that we've looked at overseas, where they do get very high proportions of their graduates choosing general practice and other primary care specialties uh, when, uh, once they have actually graduated. Uh, and uh, that is the aim that we've set ourselves and uh, uh, would hope to achieve. So thank you, uh, Tim, for the invitation. Thank you all uh, for your attention. And uh, very happy now to let uh, Peter answer all of your questions.